It's time for Tupelo Tom and Big Lou talking. And now, here's Tupelo Tom and Big Lou. I'm Tupelo Tom. And I'm Big Lou. And And we're we're talking. talking. Aren't we talking, Jeff? Look at us. We are. It's our first podcast, Tom. By the way, how about that intro? What what was that all about? Who paid for that? I know. I thought we were talking. Somebody else was talking first, but he sounded pretty official, so I'll listen to him. That was great. That was really cool. Man, we're finally doing it, a podcast. This is so much fun. I know. We've talked about this for a number of months, uh, going on probably a year, and uh, it wasn't until we really dove in that we realized, yeah, we don't know enough to do this except the talking part. So we'll do the talking, but we've got some wonderful people doing everything else. Yeah, we had some great help with Alex Mitchell, Michael Culifer, Cody Delnath. You know, we filmed a, an intro that you can see on our website, Tupelo Tom and Big Talking.com. And they did so much teaching us about this new thing called technology. I didn't know if you'd heard of it. <laughs> well, it's changing every day and they keep up with it. And my technology uh, still goes back to VHS. My light is, the light is still flashing here in, in my office on my VCR. <laughs> I have no idea what what time it is it's still noon you're saying exactly and you know we're, we're doing this uh we're recording this this uh this drops on december 1st as they say mm-hmm. uh but we're recording this uh a week or so after uh helen and uh, it takes about a week to kind of gather your your faculties back after a, a week in the woods it was an amazing jeff lewis and friends uh fall festival i had so much fun it's probably been my favorite festival that i've had I'm, i've done it nine years it's my 10th festival actually in helen georgia it's jeff lewis and friends.com you can check out all the information for that but it was so much fun tom we did a special show where we kind of did a take on the tonight show where you got to be johnny carson interview us and sing some songs that was one of the coolest nights i've ever had as a performer it was uh, amazing for me. I've always said that uh, the the time we did the Rat Pack five or six years ago was one of my most favorite times on stage. I have to say this is right up there because you gave me the opportunity to uh, do a tribute artist performance for my favorite performer in television and broadcasting. That'd be Johnny Carson. I got to do a monologue. I got to do all that cool stuff. And I think, though, the, the, the cool part for the audience, you know, besides me, was the fact that all of the guys came on stage, sang a song, came over, sat down with me, and we talked about how they got into this wacky world of being a tribute artist and, and stories about their lives. And then they they went on and did you know, another song or two. And it really, I think, gave the opportunity for a lot of the fans to hear them talk as themselves for the first time, unless they've been lucky enough to catch them off stage. Because on stage, they're kind of in the mode of performance. And this was an opportunity for everybody in the audience to find out who these guys really are. And that's what I kept hearing from people, how much they enjoyed the show. Yeah, it was great. And you know, everybody get to hear what fanatical Elvis fans we all are and how much Elvis means to us. And, you know, Tom, I got to tell you, we, we've been talking about doing this podcast. It's kind of like doing a diet. You know, we'll start Monday. <laughs> but it wasn't until you kind of really realized what we could do with this and came up with a theme for us. And tell us a little bit about what your thought process was, kind of the – birth of the idea of what we were going to do with this podcast. Well, I figured it out because I used to live in Los Angeles. I used to live in Atlanta. And in those two cities, I had hour long commutes to work. Now in LA, it was only seven miles that took an hour. (laughs) In Atlanta, it was 48 miles that took an hour, but it was still a lot of time. I wish then I'd had a podcast to listen to, to pass the time. And I've discovered as I drive around going to the festivals, your festival and and Coates festivals, that I'm listening to podcasts. And it really passes the time when you find something that appeals to you and and has a story and it's something that is of interest to you. The, The miles just seem to disappear, but I'm still paying attention to driving, of course. So we got the idea for this, but I kept thinking about, well, what would be beneficial for all of us? And it would be, well... Hey, if, if we're all driving to these festivals, what a great opportunity for, for, for the two of us to just sit down and, and talk to the fans. It's just like we're sitting in the back seat uh, without telling them where to go. And we're just talking about we're just talking about what we've been doing and what's coming up and stuff to look forward to. And and once I figured out that's what it was. Then it was just a matter of finding someone smarter than either of us to, to help us technically do that. Thank you, Alex Mitchell. Speaking of which, Tom, sitting in the back seat, uh, hopefully uh, people are on their way to the Georgia Elvis Festival, licensed by Elvis Presley Enterprises, produced by our friend Cody Dale Nath. You can uh, 
look up more of his events at etafestivals.com. He's one of our sponsors. And Jeff, you know, since this podcast drops on December 1st, they might be listening to this days and weeks after the Georgia Elvis Festival, in which case we should say, wow, didn't we have a great time? (laughs) I can predict it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that's a good point. And this, of course, leads us into January, which we have a lot of things going on. The first big one, of course, Elvis's birthday. That's right. Tom, you'll be hosting that event, right? That's right. I'll be back uh, in Memphis hosting Elvis's birthday celebration at Graceland. It just seems to coincide with my birthday every year, which is January 5th. And I appreciate it when Graceland invites me to celebrate my birthday with Elvis, which is kind of uh, what I used to do when I was a kid. My mom would have birthday cakes that would say, happy birthday, Tommy and Elvis. And I would, you know, have all my friends over and they thought I was an Elvis freak. But now I found my family. Uh, and, you know, then then I got married and my wife said I really needed to stop that. So instead of having a birthday cake with, you know, happy birthday, Tommy and Elvis, now I just go to Graceland and have birthday cake there. Tom, I think I think one thing that's going to make this podcast great is if we're honest. So if I have to call Lisa, I will. But but please be honest with our with our uh, audience out there. You do still have Tommy and Elvis. Happy birthday. This should be honest. I, I do. Yeah, okay. I do. Events that are happening at Graceland uh, is fun. Uh, we're kicking off on my birthday, January 5th. They're going to have screenings at the Guest House Theater. And Jeff, that Guest House Theater is now a very historic site for both of us and a lot of Elvis fans. It was the theater in which many of us saw the sneak preview of the Elvis movie weeks before it came out into theaters. So it's a special Guest House Theater. I got to actually ask Baz a question. How cool was that? That was, I know. I was very proud of you for that. Thank you. Tell Quickly tell everybody the question. Well, I was just fascinated and thankful, and really thankful is a better word than fascinated, that they included 1977 in Elvis' story. That's when I saw him here in Norman, Oklahoma at Lloyd Noble Center. And to me, like I told Baz, I call him Baz now, um, <laughs> the 1977 Elvis that year was as important as 1956. His voice was still there. While the ending certainly was tragic for all of us as Elvis fans, it still is a very human story, and I was so glad they put that in the movie. And Baz gave me the great compliment of saying that out of all the the press conferences he'd done, that that was one of his favorite questions. So that was just a really special moment I'll never forget. We got to see, I mean, Lisa Marie and Priscilla. I mean, everybody was there. Tom Hanks, of course, Austin, who hopefully will win an Oscar. Uh, he deserves it. Jerry Schilling was there. Schilling was yep. there. It was just, and and all, so many of our fellow Elvis fans and and family were there. It was just a moment I'll never forget. I'm just so thankful for Alicia and everybody at Graceland that allowed us to come to that. What a, what a great experience. That's right. And and more Elvis movies happening for the birthday on uh, Thursday, January 5th, 10 o'clock in the morning, free, girls, girls, girls. Then at 1 o'clock, double feature of Elvis. We're going to have Paradise Hawaiian Style at 1 o'clock on January the 5th. Then they've got a Hawaiian style dinner and dancing evening at Club Elvis. So that's cool. Happening on Friday, January 6th, they've got an excursion to Tupelo, my hometown. Uh, but I will not be a part of that. Uh, I will be there at the Guest House Theater at 11 o'clock on Friday, January 6th with Angie, and we're doing an archives show and tell, and I never know what Angie is going to bring on stage for us to talk about. And and if you uh, watched our Gates of Graceland uh, video series that we do, um, all those countless, I think we've done 35 or 40 of them, I never know what she's going to bring me. She could bring me a book with a bullet hole in it, she could bring me a jumpsuit, uh, you know, just, I never know. So I'm looking forward to that. And then there's uh, tours of the mansion in the afternoon. Uh, that'll, that'll be fun. Uh, because Graceland at Christmas time is, is just very special. The, uh, the decorations and everything, it's like you're, you're waiting on, on Elvis to come in and they've got the big pops concert on that Friday night, January 6th with my buddy, Terry, Mike Jeffrey and the Memphis symphony orchestra. Then on Saturday, January 7th, conversations on Elvis with some of the people that knew Elvis and worked with Elvis. Just so many things. Then they're going to have the special screening of Aloha from Hawaii, the 50th anniversary screening of Aloha from Hawaii. Can you remember, Jeff, seeing Aloha from Hawaii for the first time? I actually can. I was laying on the floor in my den watching it. It's where I live today. I just remember the white suit. I remember thinking it was a superhero I was watching, come to find out I was right. And, you know, Tom, to give a little preview, uh, 
in March, we will be talking about the Aloha from Hawaii concert because that is when it aired here, correct? That's right. Uh, there was a <laughs> the night of the concert in January worldwide uh, in the United States. There was a little thing, a little conflict called the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it went live to the rest of the country. They tape delayed it uh, for uh, the United States. And uh, but the album did come out in February, so we had about a month and a half to listen to the album. Uh, it was a two record disc, four sides of Elvis, and it was a quadra disc. Mm. It was it was. I listen. I was lucky to have two speakers. This thing was w- waiting on me to have four. I still don't have four speakers. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, for Christmas, uh, or maybe for your birthday, Lisa and I'll see if we can't uh, get you a couple more speakers. <laughs> uh, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm course i'm sure i'm not uh i think that super bowl would have been the miami dolphins from the 72 season to cap off their undefeated uh season that year but i digress let's get back to elvis so you know shortly uh after the birthday weekend now now is anything going on in tupelo that weekend tom well, on Sunday morning uh, at the at the mansion, they will have the proclamation ceremony with cake. Hopefully, it won't freeze and be so cold that they can't get the knife in. I don't know what the freezing point of birthday cake is, but we've hit it a couple of years when they were trying to carve Elvis's birthday cake out in front of the mansion. <laughs> and then uh, an hour or so later, there will be a celebration at the birthplace in Tupelo. And I'm so happy. Uh, I, I hope I can make it back in time for that. I'm going to be in Memphis but uh, the birthplace is only about a half a mile from my from my home in Tupelo, and I'm very proud now to sit on the board of directors of the Elvis Presley birthplace. So I'm very honored by that. That is so great. How about our freezing? Remember the year that Dean Z and his band played out by the airplane <laughs> yeah. when it was just freezing? I was on the bus with them because I had to introduce them. And uh, it was so cold. They, they pulled the little bus right up behind the stage. I ran out to do my little intro, which got smaller as I ran out there because I just thought I'm just going to say Dean Z and just get back in the bus. And then they had to go out there and play. It was amazing. I mean, the elements conspire against you sometimes in in Memphis. And of course, in January for Elvis's birthday, it's 15 degrees. And in August uh, during Elvis week, it's 115. So that's kind of the neat little dichotomy there. Well, that way we get to, we get to have the Elvis hoodie for wintertime and the Elvis tank top for the summertime. Exactly. Nothing but class in August. Nothing but class. You know what? It's just, we just look like a, it looks like the Clampets came to town, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. You know, Tom, I, uh, shortly after the birthday, I also want to mention uh, my good friend, Timmy Henry will be having a festival in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. That's right, Jeff. The Smoky Mountain Elvis Festival happening January 13th through the 15th. 2023. It's going to be great, including performances by the producer himself. Tim E is going to be there. Also Ryan Pelton and Ben Thompson. I don't know if Rianne's going to be there or not, but still I'd go see Ben. Michael Chambliss will be there and Matt Cordell. Uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting time there in Pigeon Forge and it's all happening at the Biblical Times Dinner Theater. And that is also the Biblical Times Dinner Theater is also the home of the Southern Gospel Hall of Fame. They've got a newly renovated and updated museum and Hall of Fame for Southern gospel music. So I'm sure there'll probably be some gospel music included in the show. And I guarantee you at some point, somebody's got to sing Smoky Mountain Boy from Kissing Cousins. Wouldn't you think? I mean, they'd have to sing it sometime during the Smoky Mountain Elvis Festival, but it's a licensed festival and the first qualifier of the year. And everybody I know is looking forward to that. And we're so proud of Tim E for being the first one to kick off 2023 with a qualifier. Way to go, and good luck to Tim. So, Tom, one of the things we talked about um, when we started talking about doing this podcast were Elvis stories. And there, besides the birthday in January, you know, I was talking to you about, it, it fascinates me, Elvis was born January 8th, 1935, as we all know. Mm-hmm. When he turned 19... He walked into Sun Records Mm -hmm. and recorded a song that literally changed the world. And we're going to talk about that great song, That's Right, Mama, in a future episode as well. At 21, in 1956, he would have one of the biggest years as a recording artist ever. 17 songs hitting the top 100, three number one hits. He was the biggest star in the world at that time. At 33... In 1968, he will have been on a run being the biggest box office 
uh, star in Hollywood and will go on to put on this leather suit. Yeah. Yeah. And literally once again, change the world and the way everybody looked at Elvis and change pop culture as we know it. And then of course at 38, 1973, he would do what we were talking about. The Aloha from Hawaii concert. Now, Tom, what were you doing when you were, 19, 21, 33, and 38. I assure you, I was not doing any of those things. Uh, I was not doing that. Uh, at, at 19 and 21, uh, I was at Ole Miss in theater, but I was also working part-time in Tupelo uh, at the movie theater, um, where I was working the afternoon of August 16th, 1977, as a matter of fact. And I, I kind of always kept my job because, you know, Jeff, even then I wanted to be in showbiz. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I figured being a projectionist and a, the manager of a theater, uh, I'm the last link. No matter what they spend on these movies, no matter what they pay the actors, I'm the last link of bringing that movie to the audience. No projectionist, no movie. Exactly. And uh, I used to tell actors that uh, do celebrity interviews all the time, and I would, I would tell them that, and they would sit there dumbfounded looking at me thinking, why are you wasting my time? Uh <laughs> One person actually said, um, you are actually the most important person because he said, we could do this and get paid and everybody would have fun. But if the audience paid and didn't get anything, they'd be mad at us. It was Paul Newman actually said, thank you for being a projectionist. So there's my brush with greatness. Well, that is really cool. And um, totally off the subject, but I think we will be sure and mention this gentleman at least once every podcast. You also got to meet Burt Reynolds. Yeah, oh, I did. Well, you know, uh, this podcast could have just been about Bert itself himself. If you actually asked, <laughs> and them. we might have one just about Bert. <laughs> we may. Uh, yeah, I got to work with him a couple of times uh, when I was at, I was at Turner Classic Movies for eighteen years, and uh, we had uh, a three or four year relationship with him. We got him to do a voiceover on Spencer Tracy for us, and we had him under contract to do this voiceover. And legally, the legal team from Turner would would send the paperwork to the general manager of the station. Uh, in this case, it was Tom Karsh, and he would sign all the documents. He brought that contract to me and said, I want you to be the Turner representative on this contract because I think you're the one that should sign your name next to Burt's on the contract. Well, that's great. So I did that. I, you know, you send two copies and one comes back to the files. And he kept one with my name on it, which was cool. And we and Turner kept one with Bert's name and my name. And when I left Turner uh, in 2014, one of the lawyers came to me and said, um, well, this contract is out of date now. And instead of filing it away into the archives, I want to give it to you. So I have on my wall, actually in Tupelo, I have uh, the contract uh, with, with Bert. Uh, that signed that I signed and he signed. He did a voiceover for you, right? Yeah. He did a thing on Spencer Tracy and talked about how great Spencer Tracy was. And then at one of the Turner classic movies uh, festivals in Hollywood uh, employees at TCM were always assigned a different celebrity to kind of take care of. And obviously um, I beat up the girl that was going to take care of Bert and I got to be the person <laughs> to take care of Bert. And it, it was just wonderful. Cause we had the cast of uh, deliverance there, John Voight, was wow. there and he was really a wonderful guy. He was making sure that Bert was okay. Cause Bert was in a feeble way by then he was not that yeah. healthy, but he said he had did it to himself. You know, he said that role in Sharky's machine, he broke his knee. So Jeez. there was just things he did. He didn't take care of himself, but boy, he was still Bert, you know, he was still Bert and uh, he was exactly Jeff. And you know, this from what you've done in music and, and showbiz, sometimes the worst thing you can do is meet someone that means so much to you because it's kind of the everlasting impression if they're not the greatest guy in the world. In this case, if you wrote down how you wanted Bert to be, he was that guy. Well, that is so great. I'm just glad the banjo players weren't at that party. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the thing that really bothers me when I go to Helen every year, because that's where they <laughs> shot Smokey and the Bandit. And I think, are those guys coming to the festival? Because, uh, you know. I assure you, the Deliverance banjo players will never be in Helen, Georgia. I'm going to hold you to that, Jeff. We'll be right back.
Elvis fans. ATA Festivals is bringing you 10 amazing Elvis festivals throughout the United States in 2023 that are fully licensed and endorsed by Elvis Presley Enterprises. Come see world-class Elvis tribute artists celebrate the legacy of the King of Rock and Roll in multiple production shows over the course of each festival. To find out where you can see us next, visit us online at atafestivals.com. I'm Tupelo Tom. And I'm Big Lou. And And we're we're talking. talking. So, Tom, January, a very important month in Elvis history, American Sound Studios, probably the most important album Elvis ever recorded, would you think? Um, I think, you know what? I think you might be right. I've never really thought about it that way. But think about where this album was recorded It was rec- and where in time it was recorded. Let's go back in time, shall we? Let's go back to the summer of 68. Elvis is um, shooting in, I believe, June of that year, um, the 68 comeback special in the summer of 68. It's not broadcast until December of 68. And by December of 68, he's shooting the movie The Trouble with Girls with our friend Marlon Mason. Mm-hmm. Because he asked her the next day on the set, did you see my TV show last night? And she was like, oh my gosh, yes, I saw it. <laughs> so that's December of 68. January of 69, he goes to his hometown studio, American Sound, which was really having a lot of hits at the time, and records these songs we're going to talk about. By July and August, he was opening in Vegas. Wow. That's the run he had from December of 68 to summer of 69. It was Comeback Special, American Sound with number one songs, Vegas in the Summer. And then that's, and then that's the launch of that segment of his career. And at the time, I guess Elvis was only recording uh, H&R songs. What, what does H&R stand for? Hill and... Hill and Range. That Hill is and Range, the, yes. Hill and Range and Gladys Music. That was the two publishing companies uh, that, that he owned. And Jeff, speak to us as a songwriter. Tell us about how incredibly important publishing is in making money in the music business. Well, that's where the money is. Uh, I remember when I started my publishing company, I, I was touring with opening for Buck Owens actually. And I remember Buck telling me I needed to start a publishing company. And I told him, I said, I don't know anything about publishing. He said, all you have to do is know how to take half the money. (laughs) I'll never forget that, but it's so important. And of course, Colonel Parker, understandably so, uh, wanted to control that. And when it came time, it's my understanding, ironically enough, I don't know why it's ironic, but I like to use that word. (laughs) Lamar Fike, And Marty Lacker, I guess, really influenced Elvis about recording with Chips Moman. And this would have been in Memphis, Mm -hmm. first time since Sun Records that Elvis didn't record in Hollywood or Nashville. And Chips Moman, who was running American Sound, was having hit records like, uh, you know, uh, Son of a Preacher Man uh, with Dusty Springfield. That, that, That studio... Um, Sweet Caroline, uh, I believe by Neil Diamond was American Sound Studios with the uh, Memphis Boys, the musicians that were backing these art- artists that had all pretty much grown up on Elvis's music and listened to it. And here they are just a few miles from Graceland making this incredible music. And Elvis, because he, again, he was still in that movie recording uh, era of his career. So he was just doing soundtracks. And uh, a part of that relaunch was uh, going to American Sound with Chips Moman, who had his own opinion about things, was not intimidated by anybody, especially Colonel Parker, and was actually not intimidated by even Elvis. He told it like it was, and Elvis kind of liked that. Speaking of Neil Diamond, uh, Neil was supposed to be recording that week that Elvis went into the studio, and you told me a great story about that. Yeah, Neil was booked to record a session, and Chips called him up and said, hey, Neil, hate to let you know, but uh, I'm giving your session to... uh, to Elvis Presley tonight. I'm giving him your session time. And Neil was like, hey man, not a problem at all. But he did request that Elvis cut one of his songs. And so The Grass Won't Pay No Mind uh, is is a Neil Diamond song that Elvis cut as a favor, didn't have to, as a favor to Neil Diamond and Neil Diamond's publishing. Of course, there was a young songwriter, uh, Scott Davis. I think we know him more as Mac Davis. Davis, (laughs) Davis, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, who had had uh, memories that was recorded in the the '68 special, and he had a few songs that Elvis listened to. Didn't want to do one of them, but they talked him into it, and that would, of course, be in the ghetto. Yeah, what an amazing song, an important song that was. You know, I got to meet Mac when I was a kid, 
uh, here at TGNY in Norman, Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, when I was probably seven or eight, I got his autograph, lost it. And then when I moved back home, you know, several years later, I was going through some old press clippings and it came dropping out real slowly wow. and I found it again. But then Tom, thanks to you, I got to meet him again in Memphis when he did a conversations with him during Elvis week. Well, that's right. But I want to go back to that uh, TGNY. Was he <laughs> shopping or was he at a, was it at an appearance? I mean, I, I can, I, I just see you just walking up to him in the produce aisle accosting mr davis <laughs> exactly nice melons uh no he uh he he was doing a sighting there and i just remember he was the first star i'd ever seen that wasn't a football player and uh and of course being a huge fan of his i'm a huge fan of the movie north dallas 40 and i was able to find a a helmet of the uh the north dallas bulls and when i got to meet him he signed it for me. He couldn't believe I had it. And I'll never forget you were standing there with me. And he looked at me and he said, well, do you want me to sign it as Seth Maxwell? Which is who he played kind of a take on Don Meredith. And that was so cool. And for some idiotic reason, I said, no, no, that's okay. I could have had a Mac Davis and Seth Maxwell autograph on that. But I blew that opportunity. Of course, Mac also wrote, my goodness, uh, Don't Cry Daddy, yeah. Little Less Conversation, which was in one of Elvis's movies before then. Yeah. And he recorded those. And then, of course, what was cool, too, was to find out Elvis had a cold. Yeah. And this way, he had that raspy sound. Yeah. Uh, you and I get a cold. It knocks us out. Elvis records an album and has number one hits. That's the way it goes. <laughs> that's that's one of the many differences between us and Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I just want to also tell everybody listening that that story of Mac Davis at, at Graceland when you got to meet him backstage – I had met him quickly before he went on stage uh, with me because usually at those conversations, I'm on stage the entire time. There have been people, Jeff, that I've interviewed on stage that I never met them again off stage. I never saw them before or after. It was only while they were on that I met them. But Mac was somebody that I got to meet ahead of time. And I thought, well, he seems like a cool guy. And you had also gotten me one of those uh, those helmets from the movie North Dallas 40. And so I was, I was very excited that we were going to get to meet him backstage and get those helmets signed. But during his appearance on stage, <laughs> he was talking about, you know, being a star and everything. And he said, you know, I just want to tell you that, uh, that I, I, I appreciate my fans, but I just want you to know if you walk up to me, I will not autograph. And I thought, Oh no, he's not going to autograph anything. And Tom, I was standing next to Brian Mays our friend, and I just knew he was going to say those helmets. Go ahead. Yep. What did he say? <laughs> he said, I just want you to know that I will not autograph jock straps. <laughs> That's right. That's what he said. <laughs> and I just knew he was going to say helmets. Thank God I didn't bring a jock strap for him to sign. <laughs> but he was just a great guy. And without prompting, because, you know, I, I am a fanboy. Um, he, I think he sensed it coming. And so he just said, hey, Tom. You want me to do a little bit of hard to be humble? Yeah, that's right. He did. And it kept me from having to embarrass myself by asking for it. So I, we got to all sing. The audience got to sing, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. With Mac yeah. Davis. And remember, he sang his version of Memories, which has those additional verses. Yeah. It's so incredible. Yeah. Uh, you said something. I've never told you this story, Tom. I don't even know if you remember it. But when you actually introduced me to Mac, you said... Mac, this is one of the best singer-songwriters I've ever known, Jeff Lewis. And I could have crawled into a hole. I was like, oh, no, he didn't just say that in front of Mac Davis. And it's a true story. You said that. Mac stopped what he was doing, turned and faced me and goes, oh, so you're a songwriter. And yeah. every yeah. bit of his attention was on me. I'll never forget just how kind that was. He was probably thinking in his head, who's this idiot? But it was just so nice. He just stopped, gave me 100% of his attention. We had a great talk, got a, a picture with him, and it was just a, a memory I'll never, never forget. It, it was phenomenal. I want to thank you for that. I got to know Mac a little bit and his wife, Lisa, uh, in the in the year or two after he first appeared. And his wife was telling me about Mac still loved to meet young songwriters and to co-write with them because he wanted to be a mentor to young songwriters. So he would have them come over. He lived right there in Franklin, Tennessee, where we do the Nashville Elvis Festival. He lived right there. And he would have young songwriters come over to write. Now, in his office, he had all his gold and platinum albums and all of his awards. But they didn't come to that room to write. He had a separate building 
that was like a little cottage with instruments and stuff in it because he didn't want to intimidate the young songwriter. He wanted to just be one-on-one with them and to listen to them and to offer them encouragement and not be intimidated by all the awards where uh, not too many people would think about it from the point of view of the young songwriter. And that was Mac Davis. So uh, as we're recording this, Tom, Alex Mitchell, our producer is listening. So I have a witness. You did just call me a young songwriter. <laughs> I believe I did. Okay, <laughs> I have a witness. Well, you know, one thing about the American uh, sound studios too, is it gave us the quintessential Elvis song, the song that, probably arguably is one of his most popular a signature song at his concerts. And that of course is suspicious minds. Yeah. And I was doing a little research on that and it was written by Mark James, you know, who also wrote always on my mind, mm-hmm. hooked on a feeling yeah. talking about Mac or I mean, yeah. DJ Thomas anyway, um, moody blue, not a bad career, Tom, you know, I, you know, of course I had a few hits myself. They were in polka, not didn't make as much money, but did get me a Grammy nomination but i digress uh but uh so you've had well we're almost tied you have one grammy nomination i have none so we're essentially we're, we're tied we're right there neck and neck and uh, they don't even have the category of polka anymore that's yeah. how popular the uh, polka category was in grammys well after you know jeff after weird al had that run all those years they just said we've got to retire the polka category weird al's just <laughs> and by the way i highly recommend it's not for everyone but i highly recommend weird which is a movie about al yankovic and it is fantastic. It's hilarious. I, I I can't even describe it, but that's just a little little nod to that. I just watched it the other night. It's kind of the movie version of one of his songs. It really is. It's a parody of biopics because that's what Weird Al, Al does. He makes parodies. So why would he make a straight <laughs> biopic? It's so I'm I'm excited. A brilliant parody at that too. It's so funny. So uh, I was reading an, an interview with Mark, and uh, I call him Mark. Uh, And I guess the song came from, he was married and his high school sweetheart was also married, but he still kind of had feelings for her. And his wife always kind of felt that. And he just felt like he was quote caught in a trap. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was real interesting because it's a really painful song. If if it was a ballad, it would just be a tearjerker. And then of course, Elvis's voice, uh, Chip's production, uh, the sound they had, the musicians they had, to me, it's just really a perfect record. And and Mark had actually put it out first as a single, and it bombed, uh, he said. Mm. But uh, Chips, what I think is interesting, Chips got in a lot of trouble uh, from Elvis and his people because that fade at the end of the song, he put that on the on the on the recording on the on the single, and he said, I I feel like this is kind of like Elvis in concert. He would, he would have taken it down and then he would have brought it back again. And so really Elvis was influenced by that when he performed it on stage. Cause the recording, the single recording came first and chips kind of did a Vegasy kind of thing on that single. And so f- for all those years later, that's what Elvis would do on the, on the song in concert. So I thought we can thank chips for that. And one of the amazing things about Elvis, we're going to be saying that a lot. How is it that a guy and, and he just came up with this. I mean, this didn't, you know, Elvis didn't imitate someone. You know, we're, we imitate Elvis. Everybody imitates Elvis. Elvis was the original. And here's a guy who has this perfect record, and yet he's able to get on stage and make it even better. It's just yeah. phenomenal. And again, that song, number one, that started that next phase of of the Elvis career that, uh, That takes us into Vegas, and that's the way it is, which basically serves as a trailer for if you want to see Elvis, come to Vegas. A few years later, Elvis on tour, which is a promo for, hey, if you want to see Elvis in concert, he's coming to a town near you. And then Aloha happens. Brilliant strategy. I would have loved to have seen what was going to be next in the the Elvis career, because I felt like we were wrapping up the concert years there toward the late 70s, and we were ready for for something else. 45 years later. And a movie about Elvis Presley is number one in the world. And we are selling out events everywhere just so people can be around Elvis's music. And he he has people connecting to this day, Uh, friends and family. Tom, you're one of my best friends. I met you because of Elvis. I'll be thankful for that for the rest of my life. 
and all the great memories that we'll continue to make and have. I guess that might be a good place to kind of wrap up our first podcast. So I kind of feel like, you know, we've been planning to do a podcast kind of like starting a diet on Monday. Well, I feel like it's Monday night and I only ate about 1500 calories. <laughs> and I think we, we had a good day at a good podcast. What do you think? I, I think you're right. I'm, I'm, st- I'm still a little hungry though. Uh, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Matter of fact, I'll run to uh, grab me a burger and I'll be right back. Okay. Tom, this was fantastic. It's an honor to do this. We got many more fun podcasts coming, some fun topics, special guests. We cannot wait to take this journey with everybody. Uh, please visit our website, uh, Tupelo Tom and Big Lou Talking.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, everything. And let's just have a lot of fun with this thing. And folks, please tell a friend to listen. Uh, You can email us thoughts. Please be kind. And uh, Tom, it was an honor. For me too. And I want to say I'm excited about it. And uh, like you said, it's the input of the fans we want to hear from. We kind of winged this first one, but we'll uh, keep it back on the road uh, where, where people want to go with us on this podcast. So I'm Tupelo Tom. And I'm Big Lou. And and we're we're done done talking. This episode of Tupelo Tom and Big Lou Talkin', please visit us online at www.tupelotombiglutalkin.com and on Instagram and Twitter at Tupelo Tom Big Lou or drop us a line at Tupelo Tom Big Lou at gmail.com. This podcast is made possible by executive producers Jeff Lewis and Tom Brown, producer and editor Alex Mitchell, technical advisor Michael Culliver, promotions and marketing advisor Cody Dayanath and also in part by our sponsors and listeners like you. Do you have an Elvis-related event that you'd like featured on Tupelo Tom and Big Lou Talkin'? Email us at TupeloTomBigLou at gmail.com to find out more. Hey, Jeff, you there? Yeah, man. You know, we said we were done talking, but, uh, you know, I love those Marvel movies when they come back on after everything's over. That's That's kind of like what... That's kind of like what this is. It's a it's a post podcast scene. It is, and you know what I think we should do? I think we should ask if anybody out there is hearing this to email us at our address and just say, "Hey, I was I was out here. I just wanted to let you know." But don't. But then don't tell anybody that you stayed till the end because coming up in the future we might have something really cool that we give away or something on one of these segments. So you know what it'll be? It'll be it'll be a post podcast credit club ppcc is that right it could spell something bad let's not figure it out okay all right hey man i'll see you later okay bye we're done talking really now we're done talking really 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 we're done okay now i'm done now now we're done done okay that's it done talking no talking